Our next speaker is Kinsey Irvin, and she's going to speak to us about use of fatty acid signatures to explore the river between the mountains. Thank you. trying to use 
Spanish signatures. So my study site was Sandy Creek. It's located in Western New York near Brockport. And um, I chose 12 sites throughout the river system. So site 8 is um, right here. It is the site that is closest to the mouth of the river system. In this, uh, in this stream, um, at site 5, it actually splits into two branches, the east and the west branch. So I actually have two headwater sites. So I have site 1E and 1W. And these are located where they are because beyond this, it was too shallow to electrofish, so I couldn't get any data beyond those. And if you look at the land use, um, the land use pretty much stays the same throughout the river system. There's a few changes, but for the most part, it's hay fields and cultured crops. So my methods. Uh, for this project, I collected three different species. I drowned goby, northern clear water crayfish, and striped shiner. And so I collected these three species in particular because I could find them really pretty, pretty frequently throughout the river system. And I collected them all using electroshocking backpacks. And I also collected my invertebrates by doing kit netting, and I identified them to family. And lastly, I did my water quality. Some of it was on site in the river itself, and some was in the lab where I took water samples back. So my fatty acids. My fatty acids were detected using gas chromatography and mass spectrometry, and the fatty acid and methyl esters were um, identified by comparing individual peaks to an internal standard. And just a little bit about statistics. Um, I used primer for all of my statistics, and I did non-metric multidimensional scaling plots to look at my fatty acid signatures. I did analysis of similarities to test the significance of any differences I found. And similarity percentages were used to find contributions of fatty acids to my differences I find. So first off, I'm going to talk about my water quality results. So um, temperature and conductivity are both um, can both be used throughout the river system. Temperature is, um, is supposed to be, is known, um, is predicted to be higher in the mouth of the river system. Conductivity is very hard to follow throughout the river system, so it doesn't really have a prediction. But I found in this case, um, for the fall, I found that both <coughs> temperature and conductivity were both higher in the mouth of the river system. So temperature followed that prediction. And so pH and dissolved oxygen. pH and dissolved oxygen are both um, <clears throat> are are both another way that I looked at the river continuum. So pH um, cannot really be followed, cannot really be predicted through the river continuum, but dissolved oxygen can. So dissolved oxygen should be found to be higher in the headwaters compared to the mouth of the river system. But I found in the fall that this was not the case, that I found that the mouth was actually higher. And pH, I found that the mouth was lower than the headwaters. And phosphorus and nitrogen is next. And um, if you think back to what I said before, the mouth of the river system should be higher for both of these variables. But in the fall, I also found that this, that was not the case. I found that the mouth was actually lower than the headwaters. So just a little bit about my macroinvertebrates. Um, up in the mouth of the river system, <coughs> to find a large amount of collector insects. But I found about 50% collectors and about 50% grazers, which is a lot more grazers than, I, than the river continuum would predict to be here. And when we head into the headwaters, um, the east of the headwaters was much more diverse than the west of the headwater site. The west headwater site was mostly just, mostly just those collector insects, and it was a lot higher than the river continuum and the headwater, the east headwater site um, showed a little bit more of that prediction that you would expect, where you have the, that shredder percentage, but it's very low. So now on to my fatty acid signatures for my fish. First, we're going to talk about round goby. So just a little bit of background on an MDS plot. They're based on distance, so uh, the farther away two points are from each other, the more different they are. So you can see that west, the west um, headwater site is in pink, the green is the east, and the black is the mouth of the river system. So you can see that these kind of separate out into three groups. And so these separated by certain fatty acids. And so the headwater sites um, differed from the mouth by having a higher N6 and N9 fatty acids in the headwaters, and the mouth had higher N3. So if you think back, um, this 
follows my, my prediction um, for the river. Crayfish is my next species. Crayfish followed the same type of trend that I saw in Round Gobi, with one difference. The headwater and the mouth of the river actually had high and nine in both locations. And this is due to the fact that crayfish's diet is mostly made of organic material. And lastly, striped shiner showed those three separate groups, just as before, and actually showed my best separation between my three, my three sites. And it followed just along the um, with it followed just along with uh, round Gobi, where the headwaters and the mouth are separated by those certain fatty acids. So, in conclusion, um, my water quality, um, my water quality in the head had higher total phosphorus than total nitrogen, and this was not really following that river continuum prediction. And um, my water quality found in the mouth was I had a higher temperature, conductivity, dissolved oxygen, and acidity. Which, uh, so which both, which temperature followed my prediction, but all the others didn't really have a prediction. Um, Macroinvertebrates did not really follow my, my prediction, the river continuum prediction. The yeast did have a higher shredder amount, but it was expected to be much higher than it was. And also had a, little, had, um, a bunch of collectors. The west was mostly dominated by those collector insects. And once you get down into the mouth of the river system, it became more scraper and collector. And those scrapers were a lot higher than you would expect. And for my fatty acids, my fatty acids actually followed my prediction pretty well. Um, I found that my fish and my crayfish were feeding on more terrestrial food sources up towards the head of the river system. And this was <coughs> due to me finding higher percentage of N6 and N9 fatty acids. And down towards the mouth of the river system, I found that, that they were feeding on more in-stream food, food sources, and that was due to that higher percentage of N3. So my future work. Sandy Creek is a very, it was just my preliminary study. It is a very small creek system and also doesn't have um, very good land use changes throughout the river system. So this could be due to, that's why I could have seen some of my problems with the river continuum. So my next step is, which I'm doing right now, is looking at the Genesee River, which is a much bigger river system. And it has these nice gradients going from forested all the way at the headwaters to urbanized up, at, up in the mouth. And I'm going to be doing the same type of analysis, and we'll be looking at fatty acids from a bunch of different species there, and also looking at the water quality. And I'm hoping because of the larger river system, and I have these larger land use gradients, that I'm going to see a better river continuum in this area and be able to kind of see those gradients better than the Sandy Creek. So with that, um, we would like to acknowledge my community, community members, Dr. Williams and Dr. Williams, and also many of the students who have helped out in the field and out, out in the lab. Some of them are here today. Um, and to also thank the College of Rockford, the Department of Environmental Science, and the Great Lakes Research Consortium for giving me some money to um, do this research. And with that, I will take any questions. Definitely, definitely do that. Um, 
So it's like when I had three species in Sandy Creek, um, it's, it would be difficult, but I have a bunch more species in the Gen Z. I have like double the amount. So I think that would be that would be really interesting to look at and see if if the diversity of the variants are changing. I think that's really interesting. Just give me an idea. Anything else? We have lots of time before the break. <laughs> Was your headwaters of this, was it forested or was it part of the open cap? Yeah, for Sandy Creek, the um, the actual like change in um, wooded area was not was not what you would normally expect for a river system. That's why I wasn't really expecting to find the gradients that I would expect. But we kind of started off with a, wood, a wooded area and kind of ended with a wooden area. So this this is why this was just kind of like my beginnings like try at it because nobody else has tried this so it was kind of my way of is this even possible so this in the sense. Tennessee when you do the Tennessee you're going to make sure your headwater sections are oh yes yeah. so so in the Tennessee if you go back to if you go back to here we basically start in a forest and then when we hit um, the middle of the stream it becomes more just more agriculture so the agriculture people have probably messed with have messed with that like the tree line and then up here is basically buildings so it's really really shows that change that you would normally expect in the river yes what species are you planning on using in the genesee in the genesee i have a long list so i'm looking at um large pounds of smallmouth bass i'm looking at a bunch of red horse species so red horse suckers i'm also looking at So do, do you think that the change in <coughs> land use is a potentially confounding factor that you might have to deal with, maybe statistically somehow? Yeah. So land use is really going to make a huge difference, and it did in my Sandy Creek, in my Sandy Creek sample, because um, it really messes it really messes with the tree line, which really does play a huge role in the river continuum. And so throughout my Sandy Creek sampling. I, I did see that problem, and that's really where I kind of saw the issues with my gradients. So I kind of took that into consideration that they might not, that my um, fatty acid differences <coughs> may not be really what I'm actually seeing, but in more might be just trends in that direction. And I'm hoping to find more statistical differences in my Genesee River, because I didn't find too many in the same just might add one point to keep yes. in mind is you're going to be confounded also by massive suspended sediment loads in the lower half of that, that river. Yes. But that might be another variable you want to keep track of throughout that basin mm -hmm. to evaluate later on. In the back there, one other thing you said the RCC, which is uh, imperfect at best, is you might look at uh, Fort's uh, functional process zones as a kind of a heuristic to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, and then it, it will be compounded with land use. Yes, yeah. very much so. Um, just, just a quick comment. There's probably no perfect watershed no. to do this in. No. Another thing to keep in mind is the Mount Morris Dam. That yes, that's that red kind of line. Yeah, that, that, red, that red line really does affect because my species from down here cannot get up here and vice versa. I want to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have plenty of time. And have you looked into considering some of the compound specific um, stabilized isotopes? I did or not really. Acid? Yeah, I didn't really mess with stable isotopes. I mentioned it in the talk just because it's one of the ways that people have looked at the river continuum. It's something that it, if I have time, I really want to get into. But it depends with it depends with money and with resources and help. So that's something I really want to mess with, but at this point, I haven't really done anything with it. I want to thank the speakers for keeping on time. Let's have a round of applause.